Kia ora and welcome to the finale of Vote 2023. We have a jam-packed episode ahead of us for you. Today we'll be hearing from a panel of our local Aotearoa Dunedin MPs, Rachel Brooking, Ingrid Leary and Ben Peters, as well as a panel of Otago University academics Robert Patman and Joshua James. With them, we will be discussing how they have seen and heard this election. Additionally, we will be hearing from other local politicians and academics who have generously sent us in some clips regarding their opinions on the election. Finally, we, the Vote 2023 crew, will be sharing our personal opinions throughout this election. Also, it's important to remember, Saturday the 14th is your last day to vote. Grab your mates, find your polling booth, and get out there and make your voice heard. Nada Holly and our local MPs. Hello, I'm Holly Thomas and today I'm joined by Rachel Brooking from the Labour Party and Ben Peters from Top Party. Thank you both for joining us today. So starting off, what have been the campaign highlights for both of you? Highlights? Uh, to be honest, for me, uh, I think I'm getting stopped by randoms in the street mm -hmm. uh, saying things like tail wave uh, and I voted for you and, and that's quite uh, encouraging. I'm um, hearing especially young people that are really enthused about um, having a, a positive option to vote for this election. So it's been really, really cool. We had some great debates on campus mm -hmm. and they ended up being at least three, maybe yeah. more. Uh, really yeah. amazing turnout of students as mm -hmm. well. And then being about campus the last few days asking people, maybe sometimes plaintively, have you voted yet? <laughs> uh, and everyone's saying yes, mm -hmm. which is great yeah. if students are engaged. Yeah, that is great. Is there anything you wish that you could have done differently or done more of this campaign? Not have COVID. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not isolated for five days. It's definitely yeah. something. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, I was also ill for the one of the bigger debates mm -hmm. um, that, yeah. that took me out of that. So being able to turn up for that would have been really good. Mm. Um, Otherwise, I feel like you, you give it your all. There's always stuff that you think in hindsight of, ah, oh, could have done that, maybe this. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, you run a good race and, and hope for the best. Yeah. Mm. And Rachel, this is your first time as Dunedin electorate candidate. How has it been filling the shoes of David Clark? Oh, it's been good. He's, he's been helpful mm -hmm. uh, in terms of introducing me to various different people. And I've... Uh, I've lived in Dunedin most of my life, so I know lots of the lots of the campaign team already, and was involved in campaigns back in the 90s when Pete Hodgson was mm -hmm. was the MP. So, so there's lots of people who are still there from that yeah. time as well. So it's been it's been great and, and great to be spending lots of time in Dunedin. Mm -hmm. Home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 And My kids are getting sick of me. <laughs> no. And Ben, how has the campaign been different with a refocused top um, under Raf Manji compared to last election? Yeah, it's been a very different campaign for us because we've been really going on the island strategy. So really looking at winning that electorate seat and then uh, trying to get that party vote up as much as possible. Um, it's, been a, it's just been a wildly different election without the um, massive focus on COVID like last time. Uh, so it's been a lot easier to get out about and actually campaign. Um, there was a lot of questions about whether we should go door knocking or not, whether we should interact with people or not, wear masks, all of that was it really uh, made it quite a complicated campaign last election. This election has been pretty straightforward. We've got a really clear message, you know, get island, count the party votes. Um, so that's really helped, I think, um, be able to present that clear mm -hmm. message as well as quite a good focus just on an investment in youth in terms of policy. So that's been a really lovely, uh, particularly in this town, you know, um, full of students, that's been a really lovely message to campaign on. Yeah, and top has been on the rise, but polling has indicated that there's not enough party vote mm. and RAF doesn't have island locked down. True. So if top doesn't make it into parliament, how will it maintain a political voice over the next three years? That's a great question. Um, and I'm not really sure what that looks like, to be honest. Uh, we have a, a very solid volunteer base um, and a huge amount of how top has persisted so long is that we have had an enormous outpouring of support um, all of our donors are regular small-time donors that are keeping the party afloat. And uh, so I think we've got that real grassroots movement um, that's been uh, growing. Um, we're hitting uh, the highest polls we've ever hit so far. Um, so it's quite exciting. Um, I think if they don't make it in, I'll, I'll turn back up to work on Monday feeling quite uh, relaxed uh, <laughs> rather than stressed, uh, which is my current kind of bundle of uncertainty and stress inside mm -hmm. me. So um, that'll be that'll be a big change. Um, but yeah, in terms of going forward for top, that, that's a very interesting question. I think we've got an AGM coming up in November where that would be a large part of that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. 
And Rachel, with the current polling, Labour looks like it may lose a lot of list MPs. So how do you think that will affect the Labour Party? Uh, well, obviously, having a smaller caucus uh, won't, be, won't be great. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're very hopeful that, um, and working really hard to make sure that we get good voter turnout so that uh, the, the final poll on election day is better than the polls that we've got at the moment. But we've got a hugely talented group of people uh, who are list MPs at the moment. I'm a list MP <laughs> at the moment, <laughs> but trying to be an electorate MP. Mm -hmm. But uh, coming in in 2020, we have people like Aisha Viral off the list. Um, also in my class, people who, class of 2020, um, there's amazing people like Venushi Walters, who's an electric candidate at the moment, but may well um, is in one of those seats that is normally a national seat mm -hmm. that, that turned in the 2020 elections. Incredible talent. Um, people like Nacy Chen, who's, who speaks Mandarin, which is a useful thing and is, is very youthful and um, has been a great MP as well. So. Heaps of talent, yeah. and it will be really sad if um, we don't get a really good caucus back in. Yeah. And generally, it's been a very charged campaign with culture war issues taking forefront of the election. Have you felt that this election has been more charged campaigning in Dunedin? And what do you think has been one of the biggest culture war issues that you've seen coming up in this election? Like, to be honest, like down here, it's pretty chill. Mm. I like this, and there's a couple of things that have kind of added to that. I think the uh, old rivalry of Woodhouse versus Clark, which I experienced last election, is not here in either of them. So Woodhouse being absent, and that's a national was kind of the main opponent to Labour, mm -hmm. um, and so that absence um, has has really meant that a lot of our debates have been quite calm. Um, I think they've been really respectful, which I've really enjoyed. So even issues that are difficult to talk about um, or, or can be quite charged actually. People have been able to present a reasonable view, have their time to say what they need to say um, and really just inform voters of their position. So I think that's been, yeah, I don't know, this far south it's felt just a little bit calmer. Maybe you can comment more yeah. with you've had more of the national story. Yeah, so last election I was going around four electorates in the South Island helping, mm -hmm. not standing in any of the seats. And, and there was, in, in some of the more rural areas, um, there, there were quite uh, some people with interesting ideas about the UN and very good sustainable development goals and saying how terrible they were. Mm. So things like everyone should have uh, clean drinking water and there shouldn't be child poverty. These yeah. things are bad apparently, according mm -hmm. to some people, which is very peculiar. But in Dunedin, in all of our debates, exactly what Ben said, you know, Dunedin's a very progressive city, mm. um, and th th some of the debates has been who can who can be the most left wing, <laughs> 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 you know, yeah. most, most of it, and and you know, certainly every now and people will, will give you the finger or something when you're out door knocking, mm. but generally if someone doesn't want to talk to you, it's like no, I'm not voting for you. Have a nice day, yeah. and then and then you walk away. Mm -hmm. So, but the. The stories I'm getting from other parts of the country is is that it has been more hostile, particularly if you're Maori and yeah. a Maori woman in mm -hmm. particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And national was brought up, so I was just wondering if you guys could summarise your thoughts on their campaign this election. How do you think they've presented? Oh, I mean, I haven't really thought about them much. Um, just in that, like, it's I. I've come in very much on, on running a positive campaign and promoting what TOP stands for. And I think also from a political strategy point of view, TOP's biggest hurdle is getting name recognition, being known, uh, people understanding really who we are and where we're coming from. Uh, and so we don't stand to gain anything by attacking. We don't really, it's not in my nature to, to go about a campaign in that way. So I, I, I think they've, they've I think strategically they could have played it a bit better in Ireland, uh, absolutely. But but other than that, I think um, I, yeah, I don't really have too much to say. I think Woodhouse pulling out was uh, a disappointment because I think we are better when we have um, strong uh, but robust and respectful uh, adversaries. Um, and so I think the that could have helped if he, if, if Woodhouse was able to. to to campaign because um, I think you do bring out the best in each other when you push each other to be better. Uh, but that being said, we have fantastic candidates in Dunedin standing, so there's still been a lot of that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, it has been strange internet. <laughs> no, I mean the person whose name is on the mm -hmm. is on the form here. We have, of course, had James Christmas down quite a bit, who's yes. got a good number on their list. Um, in terms of nationally, I don't know. It's a strange campaign because national uh, promises all these things that. Uh, are they really mm. uh, unlikely to deliver? So they, in, in, in the areas that I'm interested in, like climate change, they'll say, and this has been a frustration the whole term of government, they'll say, yep, we agree that we need to reduce emissions. Mm -hmm. And so, so we'll say, okay, let's do a clean car discount. That'll, that'll be a really good thing to do. And then they say, no, we can't do that. And so whenever anything comes up, no, we can't do that, but we're still going to somehow reduce emissions, mm -hmm. but with, with no ideas about how to do that and the same, the same with the university at one of our uh, debates we had um, the national representative said oh we just need to grow the economy and we'll really do that by um, people getting their mojo back. <laughs> you know, what sort of crazy yeah. economic plan is that and mm -hmm. so it's quite difficult to mm -hmm. um, deal with. Yeah and mm. um, Ben a key focus of top has been the teal card. Mm. Do you think this has been a standout policy with young voters? And is this enough to push young voter turnout? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a really clear statement that we're investing in the future um, and that young people are our future. I think there, there really needs to be that focus and wrapping that up in, a, in something like uh, the over 65's got their gold card and so young people can have their teal card, I think is a really great way of sending that message. Um, and, and it is a currently in its physical form, we have little teal cards we can hand out. In fact, I've, I think I even have. <laughs> Maybe one, one of those right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, so it's, it's physical and it's tangible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's been really good. And I've, I've got really good reception when I've been campaigning with that. So yeah, I think it's been really great to be able to have that message, especially a message of optimism um, coming into an election. There's an awful lot of doom and gloom and, and times are difficult. Um, mortgage interest rates are really high, not that most students get affected by that, but you know, the cost of living is a really core issue. And so I'm saying, actually, that's an issue. Yes, we have tax policies for that, but here is just genuine optimism for what you can look forward to in the future. I think that's a really powerful message and mm -hmm. a, good, a good way to campaign. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Rachel, do you think Labour has reached out to young voters well enough in this election? And also, in terms of TikTok, that's been a massive part of this election, the first election with TikTok. And Labour have been slightly less active on TikTok. Do you think that's played a role potentially in less youth voters? Or do you think um, not? Yeah, I'm not? I'm not sure that Labour not being on TikTok has as much as other parties. I know <laughs> that we're on TikTok. Um, is, is an issue for youth, but certainly I um, agree that TikTok does seem to be really important mm -hmm. for youth. And um, as a sitting MP, we can't have it on our parliamentary devices because of security risks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, you can have another device that you can yeah. put it on. Um, and it, yes, and I regret not <laughs> perhaps doing more of that and think about 2023 20, or yeah. putting me on it <laughs> dancing with Ben and <laughs> I think I thank you. I'm not quite sure <laughs> about that. It's, it's a bit of a thing. Um, in terms of what Labour's doing for the youth vote, uh, Labour, of course, introduced that first year free for students uh, last term. And this term, we've got the half price public transport, mm -hmm. have got the healthy home standards for rental accommodation. Want to do um, more on that front as well with, with um, rental accommodation. So I think, um, and we want to increase the amount of students at, our, at Otago mm -hmm. in particular, doing uh, medicine and dentistry, which I think is a good thing, yeah. and reviewing, of course, how universities are funded. Mm -hmm. Also this election, we've seen a rise of minor parties. Do you think this will continue? I think we had a lot of minor parties last, last time as well, mm -hmm. that these parties that I was just talking about, mm -hmm. um, and I can't remember all of their names, and they seem to have reformed yeah. in, in some way. So I think we're always going to have small parties. And, you know, it's great that you can set up a party easily in New Zealand if you've got a point that you want to make. Yeah. It tends to also be quite cyclical, so mm -hmm. you tend to see as you get further and further into a government's term, so Labour coming in, had six years, going into nine years, the 
general dissatisfaction increases. You saw it really strongly with the Helen Clark effect. Mm. Um, so in the third term, the minor parties rise up and then they collapse down again. And so we saw uh, that happen again um, in the national three terms, uh, the three part, the minor parties, if you just collect up all the minor party votes, so everything but Labour and National, it goes, it steadily increases over the kind of the three uh, cycles, uh, the three-year cycles that we have. Sorry, I was thinking and of then, minor, uh, minor parties. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. might be talking about um, the Greens. No, I was referring to minor, minor parties, minor parties. Yeah. but it's yeah. open to, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Like, like, broadly, people tend to look beyond National and Labour as we get into that, that kind of the third term, potential third term uh, of, of uh, uh, <laughs> Labour or National Government. That, that has kind of been the cycle um, under MMP. And so, yeah, it's, I think we're seeing that with like the Greens having some of the biggest polling ever, Act Na New Zealand first, um, top having some of its biggest uh, results ever as well. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I think there is that, that broadening. Mm. And do you think that top have enough momentum to try and get in for party vote next election? Potentially. I, I really don't, it, it kind of really depends on a lot of what the overall kind of picture is. I think the worse that the major parties do, the more chance there is there. And so the kind of the more disenfranchised people are with the main narrative, the more people are willing to look and explore. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when, when someone's willing to take the time to actually read up policy and see what parties are actually about, top tends to do really, really well there. Um, so that's... That's, yeah, it's a big potential. Um, love to see it if it happens. Mm -hmm. And Rachel, uh, a question that is quite difficult maybe to answer, but what do you think the rise of minority parties will mean for Labour as one of the big two parties? So by minority p parties, we're yeah, talking sorry, Greens. Now I'm yeah, to yeah. any other than the big yeah, two. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, I sort of agree with Ben in terms of that there is a cyclical nature to this. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, Labour will be wanting to increase its vote share, mm -hmm. and we're very hopeful though that we can still get the left block out voting on Saturday, yeah. and uh, th that we can can get back in mm -hmm. to government. Um, and you know, Labour needs to do what it's always done and focus on wo workers, focus on the vulnerable and also um, the environment and climate change, which we've been doing, but really to tell people that story. Mm -hmm. And also with Labour, there have been a lot of centrist policies around housing and taxing. So what would be your response to someone who would ask, is Labour still a left-wing party? Oh, I'd say have a look at fair pay agreements. That's something that hasn't happened before and has happened in this term of government. Absolutely, we're a left-wing party and mm -hmm. very focused on working people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and on the topic of minor parties this election, this uh, has seen the return of Winston Peters, who has been the talk of the town. How do you think that he keeps doing it? <laughs> I think uh, so it, it's different each time. This time I think there's been a number of cu uh, cultural touch points which he's been very happy to just jump straight into. Um, I think it's clear that there's a, a, a reasonable part of New Zealand that's feeling very, very disenfranchised. Um, and he, well, yeah, he's, he's very willing um, to, to say whatever he needs to say in, in the moment. I think we also have um, media who are very happy to hear what he has to say and, and are very willing to promote that. So it doesn't take much for him to yeah. get airtime. Um, and he's a good suit. And Jane Jones <laughs> does a good TikTok. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. And do you think the media focusing on Winston um, and continuously polling about New Zealand First support is a self-fulfilling prophecy almost then? I have real mixed feelings on that, mm. right? Because I think it, that if, if there is genuine support for a party, then absolutely they should get coverage mm -hmm. and they should uh, be shown in the news and uh, there is a genuine contest of ideas. Um, I think it's challenging with... Uh, a character like Winston Peters, um, where there's not a lot of, uh, should I say, um, trust that what he says will hold for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's quite a challenging notion. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, the, the self-fulfilling polls, I mean, we, we know that polls swing, we po know that polls move, so um, I guess from a statistics point of view, they, they do generally represent what people are um, feeling at oh, the time. Oh, it's that last time. 
And so my message to people would be to go out and vote. It's not too late. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. every vote counts. Absolutely. And they still count. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then to wrap up, for the undecided voter, why should they vote for you in one sentence? To invest in our future. Brilliant. <laughs> to keep going with all the good work that we've done and need to finish. Awesome. Great. Thank you both so much for joining us. And I'm going to hand over to Carly and Jonah now for the academics panel. Thank you. Hi Vote 23 team, it's James Meager here, National Party candidate for Rangitata. Look, I just wanted to say congratulations first on a fantastic production this year. I've really enjoyed watching all of your interviews and I'm so impressed with the professionalism and skill that you have brought to the project. I am very, very proud of the work you're all doing. So, you've got a few questions for me um, to wind up the year. What's been the most memorable moment of the campaign? Well. For me, the most memorable moment of this campaign was the day that voting opened and I walked into the voting booth closest to where I grew up, uh, at the warehouse in Timaru, and I cast a vote for myself. Now, as someone who's been involved in politics for well over a decade, it was quite surreal and actually quite humbling to be able to cast a vote for myself and it's a moment I'll cherish forever. Uh, second question, what is the one issue that I wish received more attention? Well, I actually think it's a shame that not enough focus was given to how cutting taxes for working New Zealanders hugely benefits young people, especially students. Uh, there's possibly no other group in society who needs to keep as much of what they earn as they can as students do. Uh, I lived on bugger all and I know what an extra $20 a week would have meant to me as a student. So I think it would have been great to hear more about why it's important for working Kiwis to be able to keep as much of what they earn as they possibly can. Now, third question, the election has been divisive and how has negative rhetoric shaped the election and what does it suggest about the future? Yeah, I've actually been, been really disappointed in the amount of negative advertising, third party advertising and attacks politics which has gone on and taken place this election. That's not my style and I don't think it serves the election very well or the electorate very well at all, I should say. And someone who has been studying politics and lived with the experts on negative advertising in New Zealand I don't think it actually works either. So if you follow my social media, I try to be relentlessly positive and community focused and keep my criticisms to policy and philosophy rather than attacking the people. So I guess if you want to see more positive politics, you can follow my page um, and also you can elect MPs like me. Finally, what are my plans for election day and do I have any predictions? Well, because we can't campaign on election day, it actually becomes quite sedate for me. Um, quite relaxing. I, I don't want to risk being seen to campaign, so I've got a very low-key day planned. I've got a volunteer's barbecue at the Raptor Trust down at the Eco Centre, and then I'll be watching South Canterbury beat a Whanganui for the Meads Cup for the third year in a row at Tamuka. That's Heartland Rugby. That's the best. Um, and then, of course, followed by our election night party in Timaru. And my pr prediction, we will see a blue wave on Saturday. National will win the election, and Christopher Luxon will be our next Prime Minister. That's my big prediction. So thank you again for the opportunity to be a part of Vote 23. Best of luck to all candidates around the country and I hope to see a few of you again as the MP for Rangitata. Hey, cheers and take care. Kia ora and welcome back to Vote 2023. Today we're doing an academic panel and we have the pleasure of being joined by Joshua James and Robert Patman. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. So to start off our segment, we thought we'd do some quick fire questions. Number one, have you voted yet? Yes. Yep. I took my class to vote on Wednesday. No, I haven't voted, but I'm voting tomorrow morning. Good. It's a little ritual in the family. Oh. Could you each give us three words to describe this election campaign? Oh, hectic, long, uh, and democratic. Good? Good. Yeah. Four words. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, divisive, um, unpleasant. And I think it's been demonisation. Oh, all very positive things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, that's what I said. Any interesting predictions for how the next 24 hours will go for the election? Uh, voting will open, hopefully, uh, by any, any major events happening. Uh, I think election days run pretty smoothly in terms of the, how they actually run. So that is good. Uh, but from 7 o'clock, I guess it's anyone's guess on terms of we'll get the advance vo votes straight away, pretty much at 7 o'clock, um, which will be good. And then 
yeah, I guess the results will come in through the night. I'm unsure who will have an early lead. I, I'm just unsure of the results more generally, yeah. Um, I think it's going to be very close, mm. um, much closer than the poll suggests. We've yeah. got still, I think it was 17%, was it, Josh? Up, up to 17%. Up to 17% of people are undecided. And I think the last two debates, uh, although one was interrupted by COVID, um, uh, I think have been quite significant um, because uh, although they were both quite bruising affairs, I think they were quite revealing for, of, of both the major leaders. One of the things that strikes me in this campaign um, is that the minor parties, I mean, the, both the major parties have struggled, actually. I think th mm. they, they both, neither of them have really, you know, imposed themselves yeah, during the campaign. On that, do you guys think that Labour and National are too similar? Uh, I mean, they are very ideologically uh, close. Their approaches perhaps differ. I do think that um, the debates are a reflection that uh, our media hasn't moved on to a post first past the post system. It doesn't make sense in my mind to have a major leaders debate and cut out the minor parties uh, because equally uh, they should, in theory, have equal weight in the democratic process. Uh, but I mean, National and Labour are very similar. Um, they, at the start of the campaign, they both kind of ran into the centre ground, which is where, when we think of a distribution of voters, in theory, most voters are. So it makes sense then that they uh, did that electorally, um, but it's meant that the minor parties act as kind of these engines of ideology on the outset. Mm. Um, yeah, and that's why we do see stark differences between the minor parties and the major parties. And Robert, your take on that? Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think that the Greens have been the beneficiary to some degree of Labour's reticence to set out a clear vision and do what many of their supporters expect. For example, with only country in the OECD, which doesn't have a capital gains tax, and there's this constant, you know, and that there's a constant and understandable desire on everyone to get the housing situation improved. But it's you know, until something like a capital gains tax comes in, it's very difficult because 90% of new properties are built, are bought by people who already have properties. So that makes it very difficult for people to get into the housing situation. I think the Greens have actually um, performed pretty well overall in terms of the consistency of their performances in debates. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, it's, it's a very interestingly um, balanced election. It'd be very interesting to see what comes out of this because for me, as someone interested in international relations, I've been very disappointed that they haven't dealt with those issues which I call interdomestic issues, those issues which are neither foreign policy or domestic policy, climate change, um, the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine which has had huge impact in the region and also in New Zealand in terms of inflation, pricing of commodities going up. And also, of course, uh, uh, the whole question of AUKUS, which is a momentous decision for this country, because were we to join that second leg of AUKUS, uh, that would actually cut across the uh, identity that New Zealand has carved out for itself when it embraced non-nuclear security, uh, moved closer to the Pacific, and, had, and, and has also uh, been a part of the renaissance of uh, indigenous and Maori um, things in, in New Zealand. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a lot at stake. We've had very little discussion on these things. Perhaps the last uh, quick fire question, and maybe the hardest. What is your election night go-to beverage? Uh, a, a good beer. A nice, a nice beer. A lager, IPA? An IPA or an APA. A, well, Garage Project oh, beer beer yeah. is, is, is my go-to. Uh, just the one. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like Botany Bay Gin. Botany Bay and Gin on Tonic. Mm. Mm. So, so uh, what are your guys' predictions for election night in terms of results and coalition over negotiations afterwards? Look, I think that we won't know the full final results for a good four weeks. Uh, by the time they count overseas votes, uh, we will have a bare minimum. Uh, the results immediately at seven o'clock and then from about 10 o'clock we'll have a good idea. If Winston Peters sticks to what he has done in the past, he'll wait till all votes are counted, which can take you know, up to four weeks before the writ is returned. Um, so I guess uh, it'll be close. I think that there's a number of options that could come out of it. One is that it could be a Labour Greens to party Māori coalition 
and the other is National Act, with New Zealand First sitting on the sideline, uh, sitting on the cross benches and vetoing or vetting every piece of legislation, or New Zealand First goes into a formal coalition. If that is the option, I don't know how long that government will last. Uh, New Zealand First, uh, Winston Peters and David Seymour don't get along, so I'm unsure how <laughs> long that government will um, be stable. Uh, but I also think that a lot of people have been doing the calculations wrong. So uh, we could be looking at a 124 seat parliament uh, if Te Pāti Māori win the Māori electorates uh, that they're polling well in. So I think that the math has been based on a 61 seat majority and I don't think that will be the case. And it's definitely not the case with the Port Waikato by-election. So it's going to be a long, my, my guess would be that it's a long protracted coalition negotiation um, and I guess it'll be interesting to see in a couple months' time when uh, there's meant to be a speech from the throne from the Governor-General and what is said, because we might not have a government. So Chris Hipkins, as acting Prime Minister, will, well, as Prime Minister in the caretaker role, will have to give a speech saying that we have no government formed yet. Yeah. So it's going to be a long, drawn-out process, unless you know, there's a, some sort of a landslide that hasn't been detected in the polling. Um, and Labour is on an upstick uh, with the polling, so it could be that it is quite an easy Labour Greens to party Māori negotiation, but I think it's just too close to, to tell right now. Yeah, would you agree? Yeah, I agree with Josh. Um, I, I think uh, one of the fascinating things is that Chris Hipkins has categorically ruled out anything to do with Winston Peters. And I'm wondering if it will come down to whether Chris Hipkins will face a difficult choice of going into opposition or actually forming a government which involves Winston Peters. Now, that, that would be an interesting situation. What we have seen in the past, and Josh can correct me here, but it, what we have seen in the past is where politicians do say they won't work with a certain individual and they end up working with them. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see what happens. I think strategically, though, it would make sense for Chris Hipkins to take a year in opposition and wait for the government to implode yeah. rather than trying to work with New Zealand First. Um, it would make no sense to try to build a four-party coalition. Um, instead, uh, you know, if I was Chris Hipkins or advising Chris Hipkins, I'd be saying, let National Act New Zealand First try to form a government. They won't last particularly long, judging by just how volatile their leaders are um, for Act and for New Zealand First. So, yeah, you, you know, he's been in opposition before. What's a year? school all over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can, be, it can feel a little bit like that. Um, but I think that's just some of the messiness of the MMP. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh, question for you. Mm -hmm. Do you think any uh, particular politician, especially maybe a younger politician, has stood out this campaign? I mean, it's hard not to say Chloe Swarbrick. Um, you know, I think that she has future Prime Minister material, though much like Jacinda Ardern, uh, probably wouldn't want the mantle. Uh, which I think is also a good sign of a, of a politician. Um, in terms of other minor, I mean, Brooke Van Velden has done a good job in some regards, if we're act, in terms of getting the message out there. She's pretty much secured a second electorate for them. Um, so I think the act will pick up that second seat. So I think she has done a really good job uh, in that regard, yeah. I've been impressed by James Shaw. I thought he delivered some superb um, zingers, as they call them. <laughs> and uh, I think he's been, he's a person who carefully prepares, and it shows when he has public appearances. Um, so I think he's really, uh, I don't know, I just get the feeling that he's politically got, uh, in a personal sense, a momentum. And uh, I think he can, I'm hoping um, that he will be part of a coalition going forward, because I think he's got, he has embraced some of the longer term issues. Mm that I think we need to as a country. It's interesting though, a year ago, James Shaw was nearly attempted yeah. to be rolled and he's done this huge 180, um, perhaps learnt from that, from uh, the vote of no confidence that his party delivered. And I think he's really, you know, been a lot clearer in articulating his, his message after that. So it was perhaps a good learning moment for him. Mm. Yeah. Definitely, and I think his appearance on Vote 2023 yeah. also <laughs> helped his campaign. I'm sure. <laughs> um, this is a question for both of you, but we'll start with you, Mr. Patman. Uh, what issue do you think should have received more coverage this election? Well, uh, I think that climate change... Um, James Shaw has been quite... You know, the Greens have been quite strong on this, but I feel the two major parties have squeezed the issue somewhat. 
they they tend to veer in the direction of what I call meeting short-term political needs rather than dealing with future climate requirements. And it, it, I, I think that's disappointing. Um, we are facing all, uh, you know, scientific friends across the university are really animated about this subject. We, we are getting some really worrying signs and um, the window is rapidly closing whereby we can do something about this. And I, I, I'd like to see New Zealand show some leadership on this issue because we, we have a huge stake in a stable climate like many other countries. But I, I, I just, you know, I, I think that's what's been a bit of a disappointment for me um, that the major parties, uh, Labour, of course, I would say they could argue that they're much more progressive on this issue than national. And I think that's true. But um, I'm a bit disappointed that as part of getting back to bread and butter issues, Chris Hipkins cut some of the funding that was allocated for climate change measures, which I think is disappointing. Climate change. And you, Josh? Probably who can and who can't vote. So I think this should have been a broader discussion about returning uh, the franchise to incarcerated people, uh, lowering the voting age, making it easier for overseas voters. You know, these questions of who can participate in our democracy has been largely absent from the discussions, which I think is quite a shame. Um, with the ongoing review into the electoral law and the role of elections, I think that perhaps the timing of that you know, if it had been done earlier, then we could have had some of those recommendations implemented. Uh, but no, I would have liked to see uh, us as kind of a polity or as a, as a civic grouping debate more strongly about who should and who shouldn't have a say um, in our democracy. Yeah, and adding on from that, um, how do you feel voter engagement has been this election in general? Um, Good and bad. Advanced voting statistics are looking pretty uh, good above the 2017 rate. Uh, there has been some reference to the 2022 election advanced voting statistics. Uh, I would uh, encourage academics not to look at the 2020 statistics because it's such a hard, unusual case study that we can't read into trends, uh, trends into it. Um, but I mean, you know, you are getting quite a lot of engagement. There are still a lot of people left to vote, mm. um, at least, what, two million or so. Uh, but I think that most of them, a good chunk of those, will vote on election day. I think this uh, election campaign has been more contested, perhaps, than previous, in terms of the contest of ideas, or at least mm. it feels that way. So I think voters are waiting till election day to make up their mind. Uh, and watching the campaign from day to day. And you know, when you look at the up to 17% of undecideds, they will wait until election mm -hmm. day, um, or perhaps not vote at all. Uh, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, in terms of our total turnout rate. Mm. And Robert, what's your perception of uh, voter engagement? Um, well, a couple of aspects to that that has struck me. Um, one thing that's disappointed me, and I choose my words carefully here because there's there's you know, some really excellent people in the media, so I'm not blaming the media. But one thing that I think that politicians sometimes have got away with quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, what I mean by that is uh, Mr. Peters is, for example, a New Zealand First, they've been unashamedly populist, but they haven't really been interrogated. I, I haven't yet to see an interview where Mr. Peters had to defend uh, choosing a Trump title, Take Back Our Country, for his campaign. Why, why he should have been faced a real interrogation about why he did this, what, what does he see the value in that, et cetera. Um, uh, that, uh, and the other thing is, which sort of flows from that, I've been concerned about the demonization of the media by some politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, it really irritates me when politicians in a democracy make the media the enemy. Uh, the media play a very valuable role. It's very important that people are held to account. If you go into politics in a democracy, you should, as part of your job, expect questions. In fact, you should relish it. And, um, I, you know, I, I'm a, I may sound a bit old-fashioned, but Harry Truman, a former US president, once said, with regard to democratic politics, if you can't stand the heat in the kitchen, don't go in the kitchen. Uh, that he was referring to the political kitchen. And, you know, in a sense, I get a bit tired when I keep hearing these politicians complaining about the media, not asking the questions they want. Um, it, it seems to me... Really, what they're saying is that that, that they don't that they don't feel that they have to answer these questions, and it's an, it's it's almost a sort of creeping authoritarianism, which I don't like. 
And um, yeah, I, I hope that we can correct that in the future because I do think when politicians don't appear on the radio when they should and don't answer the media, um, they're not really acting in a democratic fashion. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one of your colleagues, Janine Haywood, has spoken about how this campaign hasn't necessarily been worse or me more negative than other campaigns, but there has been a rise of misinformation or disinformation. What are your opinions on that and how voters are engaging with informative election processes? I mean, there's a couple ways you could answer this and a couple things to unpick. I think that, you know, if we look across the campaign as a whole, what metric would you use to measure how positive or negative it has been? Uh, we have seen a really strong attack ad by the Council of Trade Unions uh, on Christopher Luxon uh, and his credibility, and that is unusual uh, for New Zealand politics. So I think that kind of sets some of the tone of the discussion. Um, but I think post-COVID, we're all a bit perhaps more fragile than we used to be about these kinds of discussions. So even though it might not empirically be true that it's more negative, for me at least it definitely feels more negative. Right. Yeah. Mm. No, I agree with Josh. I think it has been more negative in my view. And I think the social media does fuel it. Mm. I mean, in, in many of us go, you know, I, I'm a junkie of news, so I, 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 I really like the media and, and, and also all the new social media sources. But what struck me is just how incredibly uh, negative some of the comments are, and quite unfair as well, uh, about you know people from various parties. And um, it, it does seem that you know one of the strengths of the social media is that people can express their views. But I suppose that one of the weaknesses is sometimes very unfair. Yeah. Mm. So Joshua, in your uh, first appearance on the show, you yeah. said that you thought the election campaign was shaping up to be pretty abysmal. Yep. Yeah. Do you stand by that? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, there hasn't been really a good contest of ideas when you have the two major parties offering largely similar policies. Um, I just feel like New Zealand politics is so devoid of ideology. Um, even ideology that you can disagree with, it's good to have ideology in there. You know, have some conviction between, behind your policies. Um, and I just feel like that has been absent um, from this campaign. Yeah. Mm. And just as we're wrapping up, how do you think the weather tomorrow is going to shape voter turnout? Uh, weather has a huge impact on voter behaviour. Um, for every inch, it drops 2% uh, participation rates. So uh, for some electorates, there will be big effects. So there's weather warnings in Wellington. Uh, Wellington Central is a close three-horse race. Uh, if we get significant rain, it'll stop young people from voting. And if you get 6% um, of, of young people not voting, then National could easily win Wellington Central, which would be um, the first time to happen in a long time. So the weather will play a big effect, and I think that parties on the left will be concerned about it, or at least they should be concerned about it. So the rain is undemocratic. The rain is undemocratic, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but it shows why we should encourage advanced voting. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't matter, you've got two weeks to go and vote. So, yes. you know, it doesn't matter if one of those days is raining, get it done early. Yes, and we know, Mr. Patman, you're voting tomorrow. Yeah, definitely. So I hope you enjoy the process. Um, thank but you. that's all the time we have for today. And thank you so much to Joshua James and to Professor Robert Patman for joining us today. Thank you. I'm Carly Dewar. This is Joan Broughton. Thank you for tuning in to Vote 2023 and stay informed, stay engaged, go enroll and vote. Congratulations to the Vote 2023 team for a fantastic series that you've been running. I've thoroughly enjoyed watching all the interviews and thanks for the chance to share a few reflections uh, in the final run up to the official election day tomorrow. Um, so I've been listening out during the campaign for policy, like I think a lot of people have. It's been quite hard to find sometimes because there's been an awful lot of noise about other things that can become very frustrating for voters. I really hope that um, you've managed to hear some policy that has engaged you in the campaign and um, connected you with a party and given you some ideas about who you're going to vote for. I don't think this campaign has been more negative than campaigns in the past. When you've looked at as many uh, election campaigns as I have, um, you realise that they have been very negative in the past. Some of our first-past-the-post campaigns were incredibly negative 
Um, some of them really only negative. But I do think what is interesting this time has been the mis and disinformation element of it. And I'm looking forward to seeing what some of my colleagues who work in that area produce in terms of evidence and analysis of what it is we've been witnessing, who's been engaging in that and to what extent. In terms of what happens next, I think it's going to be fascinating to see what we learn this time from MMP. So I think, as many others do, we may, although I don't like making predictions about New Zealand politics, but I think we may see um, something new in terms of the coalition arrangements, the negotiations, the discussions. As I said, we learn something new from MMP every time that we have an election. And in this case, I'm looking forward to seeing, if, we, if necessary, how new conventions emerge um, and the old conventions are forced to bend a little as we move into perhaps new territory. But whatever happens, my final message is please get out and vote. Take a friend with you. Take a whole bunch of friends with you. Pick up some other people along the way to the voting booth. Um, think about what you've heard. Hopefully you've heard enough and seen enough. You can register and vote today and tomorrow on the official election day. It is just never too late. So make it count. And I look forward to, um, you know, what happens next. Hey, Kona. Kia ora, everyone. Um, we're the Vote 2023 crew, and we're just going to really informally share some of our thoughts about the election. So I was wondering, guys, who do we think is going to win? Who is going to get the most votes this election? I think NZ Loyal might just pull through. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're the underdog. They've mm, got to come mm. out on top. Okay. Yeah, it is looking like a national act, perhaps coalition, but you never know. Who, who are they pulling? Like, who are, who's going to, you know, who's saying the polls? So I don't know. Mm. Which party do you guys think has had the best campaigns, regardless of our political views? See, I would say NZ first, but purely for Shane Jones' TikTok songs. True. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's so weird that TikTok has become such a central part of the campaign, at least, like, for us. Like, I don't see much of Labour, so I really just think of the left as the Greens. Like, that's sort of the side that I'm thinking of. And then New Zealand first and National. And I, I find that ACT, weirdly on their social media, always declares themselves the winner of every election. <laughs> they always say that David Seymour has won every debate, regardless of whether or not he's done particularly well. Mm. Yeah, that's so true. But yeah, if you look at National and Labour's um, advertising campaigns, I think they have very different strategies. I feel like National has a tendency to kind of dog on Labour a bit, whereas Labour kind of focuses on themselves. They're just all about themselves, those ones. So yeah, mm. I think that's interesting. I think National are innovating quite a bit with TikTok. You see, uh, you'll see a video of like Christopher Luxon giving a talking point, and then there'll be a Subway Surfers video <laughs> next to it, or like a really satisfying video of someone scooping yeah. sand or something. Whereas I don't think Labour is really doing that kind of stuff. They're more kind of doing being a bit old school. Um, but yeah, it's been interesting to see. I think the campaign, the campaign funding has been so dramatic. Like you can really see the difference. Mm -hmm. I think Labour's what around six hundred thousand dollars whereas Nationals 2.2 million, something like that. And that's just outrageous. I mean, what, what effect do you guys think that's having on the election? I mean, yeah, you, don't, you can't discount it because money means more people out there who you can pay to campaign, more billboards you can buy, et cetera. So I, I think it's definitely having a big effect on national success this election combined with all the other favorable conditions mm -hmm. for them. Definitely, and looking at the target groups and the typical voter pools of each party, um, National do tend to take in a lot of uh, fundraising efforts and stuff like that from their target groups, which makes sense if you look at it. My, the thing I keep coming back to this election is, around young, like youth politics, is, you know, in previous elections we've always sort of seen young people trend pretty heavily towards Labour and the Greens, but from what I'm hearing now, it really doesn't feel that way anymore. It feels like there's this real pull towards a youth right-wing party, and I, I was just sort of wondering if that's just a me experience. What kind of circles are you in? <laughs> <laughs> Look, most of my mates are from Hamilton. So. I was say no more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it really does depend on what kind of bubble you're in. I think I'm in, I'll, I will admit, I'm in a bit of a student lefty bubble where it seems most of my cohort are leaning towards the left, but I, I've, I've seen some polling that suggests that, yeah, there definitely is a youth right-wing cohort. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I feel the same. A lot of my friends are more left-leaning, but also there's the question of, like, how do you stay friends with someone who has differing political beliefs? Like, would you guys consider that in friendships? Slightly. Yeah. Like, I don't know. If if they were willing to have, like, a big, uh, like, an open conversation, then it would be, like, more fine. But I think it would be difficult if it was, like, mm -hmm. we were. Like, if they voted NZ first, they're just like... I think for me there's like there's a point and it's like I know when someone's crossed that point of like yeah. okay that's a that's an opinion you could have I don't agree or associate with that at all and for me like I can like like I said like I can get along with someone who votes national act even if that's not my personal political view at this current point in time um, but there are certainly political parties this election where you sort of go oh okay Let's, let's pull the reins up there, that feels like it could do some harm to some people. Um, and I think like that, like the thing I keep hearing about this election is that it's like people are scared. Like gen genuinely, people are scared of the possibility of the government either not acting on climate change, of uh, not being sensitive to gender issues, like all of these sort of anxiety. I mean, has that produced a different kind of election? I mean, we're seeing a lot of, sorry, I'm talking a lot here. <laughs> we're seeing a lot of like, um, you know, we, like there's always the New Zealand trend of like following around politicians and bullying them, but I feel like that's really stepped up this election. Yeah, and I don't think we're very good at bullying our Gen Z voices. We kind of say like passive aggressive comments like, oh, who did your haircut? Or, oh my gosh, <laughs> get a new suit. Like we're not very good at that kind of bullying thing. Are you going to ask Chris Luxon who did his haircut? I mean, that would be pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> that one's too good. I have a question, actually. Out of Christopher Hipkins and Christopher Luxon, who do you think pulls off the Christopher name better? Like, who suits Chris... it more? I think Chris Hipkins. <laughs> yeah, that's a real terrible question, and I can't see why. Because <laughs> it's like the battle of the Chrises this year. Yeah. It's like really interesting to see how people are, you know, comparing them in different aspects mm -hmm. down to their name. Who would you guys have rather interviewed? Like some more Hipkins, yeah. I'm biased because of the Dimutaka electorate, so Chris Hipkins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'd say Chris Hipkins too, because I, I would I would hope that he'd come out with one of those little zingers that he always seems to have, even if he's supposedly king of the gingers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I think he'd be a really fun to interview, and I think like in a situation like this, he'd be pretty personable. Like he always seems to come across, across really well yeah. on podcasts yeah. and more informal stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I think I would have loved to interview either, but yeah. um, I think definitely Chippy would have been a bit more kind of personable <laughs> and enjoyed that kind of informal setting. But Luxon, of course, would be really interesting to hear mm. what he had to say. Who's been your guys' favourite interviewee that you've had? Well, Winston. you had Winston. Winston. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. that's kind of a roller coaster. You just have to sit through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what's coming next mm. with Lenny. Mm. Definitely. Liam? I think Francisco. I really enjoyed yeah. um, interviewing Francisco. Granted, and I'm sure, I hope Francisco doesn't hate me for this. He's a bit of a waffler. Um, but one, like, once he gets started on an issue that he t really cares about, he's really intelligent. He speaks really intelligently about the issues and he knows what he's about. Um, and uh, I mean, of course, there's the photo of us both going like that. Like, it, like it's just so much fun to interview him. Um, and I found that that kind of came through in the interview a little bit, hopefully. But yeah, I think Taku Ferris was really interesting yeah. for my point, getting a completely different mm -hmm. perspective to what we typically have heard. And then also Dr. Ben Peters, like the Opportunities Party. I didn't even think about them last election, and this election they're doing so well. Yeah. What do you guys think of the minor parties or the Greens and top, and they're rising? For me, I, I, I'm, I'm sceptical about top, not in their like p policy, but just in the like strategic aspect of it. I think for top, I'm very, like it really centers on RAF getting ILM. Mm -hmm. If not, all of those party votes for top, because they won't get into parliament, mm -hmm. then go to the national party. And I wonder how much top, votes have top voters have considered that. Like I know last election, there was a big fear that strategic voting top wouldn't pay off but that seems to sort of be ignored this year. Like I'm seeing a lot more investment and interest in top um, and, that, and that, that could just be Raf Manji. That could be more personable um, candidates for top. I'm not sure, but yeah, I think, I mean, the Greens and ACT have done shockingly well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even New Zealand first, going from yeah. out of government back in, back in. potentially. Um, you just can't leave it alone, can you? Old Winnie, he just loves government so much. He loves it. <laughs> <laughs> he loves government. <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> does. It's more the, the aspect of it. 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely think it's been the election of the minor parties, and mm -hmm. people are fed up with the main two parties. I think that's a big takeaway looking at the polls mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. I think the issue is that the main parties are just really, to me, they feel too similar. Like, it, yeah. I don't think Kiwis, you know, Labour, to me, aren't projecting a vision. National can sort of say, well, you know, you're doing, you're going to be pushed by the Greens to do these more progressive things, but Labour's sort of shying away from that. They don't have that sort of clear vision that they had under Jacinda. Um, and National can sort of just say, well, what have you done for the last six years and battle COVID? And Labour, to me, haven't really felt like they've responded to that criticism really well. Um, and I feel like that's definitely lagging. And I feel like if they had that sort of forward-looking vision, um, it would really benefit them in the polls. And I think the conditions now, like the climate crisis on the one hand, the cost of living crisis on the other, is like a breeding ground for going more far. Like I think people just would think that maybe the centre parties aren't like extreme enough to do anything major. Yeah, and last year, we, oh, last election, we had the red wave and that was led by Jacinda Ardern mm -hmm. and her response to COVID and other things. Do you guys think that Labour's kind of failed to capitalise on Jacinda's soft power and perhaps they haven't quite brought in the same amount of viewers or supporters because of that? Well, I, th uh, well, I was just going to say, I think it's hard because she's kind of out of the spotlight now. Mm -hmm. She very clearly mm -hmm. doesn't want to be yeah. involved with the spotlight and fair enough to her. So yeah. it's, yeah, they really need someone. This is nothing against Chris Hifkins, but <laughs> I think, you know, they, they need to look for a new kind of charismatic vision to project and they can't just kind of fall back on Jacinda. Yeah. yeah. This, this might just be me. I feel like Chris Hipkins um, is the safe choice. You know, he's not quite as divisive as some other Labour politicians. He's really straight down the middle. He's very personable. He's the kind of guy you could get a beer with. Like, he, he just seems to really get along with everyone really well. But I feel like for Labour, I don't know how well that's playing. I feel like people need to see that Labour are willing to fight for them not necessarily just be in government. Mm. I, like, I don't think that's good enough for voters anymore. And I think they're becoming really critical of Labour because of that. Yeah. What do you guys think are big topics and issues that either our interviewees or like politicians more generally have been dodging? Oh, Co-governance, that always yeah, seems to be come up. Really big, and they though. always like trail mm -hmm. off into like pre-planned answers yeah. it sounds or something we've already heard in the media. Yeah. I think unfortunately around co-governance, it's just no one wants to put their foot in it. No. You know, like... They don't want to step on anyone's toes. Yeah, which is kind of disappointing because it's a question that needs to be answered and it's important that our governments reflect it today and that they acknowledge their commitments there. Um, and them sort of skirting around that issue, I think, is quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, I want to see how, <coughs> how, if they come into government, how they will interact with Mana Whenua and how they will respect it to the Like that, that is an important part of the relationship, like how they maintain that. Um, to me, that feels really important. I think so too. And I think a huge part of that about why a lot of these parties are kind of toning it down with co-governments not wanting to bring it to the forefront is because it has become such a divisive mm. hot topic and you've got parties like ACT wanting say like a referendum on the treaty and they're making it this big thing. And I think Labour, uh, National, they don't want to kind of touch that. And I, I think it's a kind of thorn in their side, really. Yeah. I think we've also shifted away from it a little bit. Like, <clears throat> last election or last couple of years, co-governance was really central. But now, like, we say this is the minor party election. This really feels to me like the cost of living election. Like, that's, that's all I'm hearing. I find that I'm watching the finance minister's debates more than I'm watching the leaders' debates mm. because I'm so scared of like what could happen and how that could go between um, different finance ministers and and they seem more fire and more more interesting and like to me personally, the going back to that thing of vision like Grant Robertson really presents um, that vision for Labour. He's willing to fight for the public. Clearly, I mean, if you watch those interviews, he's just no Nicola and he's pushing through and he's just he's really fighting for his ideas and it, and it, I think it really comes off well. Mm. Yeah, and I think Grant was actually quite disappointed about the whole um, Labour's kind of uh, backing down from the wealth tax and yeah. capital gains Yeah, what's tax. your guys' thoughts on that Labour backing down from the capital gains tax and everything? Oh, man. I think, to me, it was the smart play at the time, but I don't think it's paid off. I think they've lost a lot of voters to the Greens and the Party Māori because of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
Granted, those will still probably be in coalition with them, um, but I think in terms of like sustaining Labour as a party, I don't know if it was the best move. I mean, it's clearly got popular support, even within the party, like, you know, high ranking David Parker and um, again, Grant Robertson pushed for a wealth tax and capital gains tax. And to me, it just sort of feels like Labour could have pushed a bit harder and they could have explained to the public the benefits, but I feel like they really just sort of fumbled the ball on it. I think with that, I think Labour have been like, in the case of the capital gains tax and wealth tax, they've been playing it safe. But I think in doing that, they've like lost a bit of their left-wing identity mm -hmm. because then they're, if they're just playing it safe, they're going centre and people are going to more greens, like you said. That's all the time we have here today. Um, I, as you can see, there are lots of discussions ongoing. Um, if you want to have these conversations with your mates, absolutely feel free. These are exactly the kinds of conversations you need to be having. Thanks, guys. Thank you to everyone who's followed our show this year. We really appreciate your enthusiasm. We want to give a special thanks to the Otago University Politics Department, especially Peter Grace, for helping us organise all this. Also, a big thank you to the team over at Media Productions for helping us get this whole thing set up. We could not have done this without them. A massive thank you to our researchers, presenters, social media team, producers, Liam and Sophie, and to our editor, sound engineer, and camerawoman extraordinaire, Lily. This show wouldn't have been what it is without you. So, remember to get out and vote before voting closes tomorrow on Saturday the 14th. The Youth Voice counts this year and your vote can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you.